Hello YouTube, my name is Zach, and today I'm going to be doing something just a little bit different from what I've done the past few weeks. As you all know, I've kind of made a habit of doing these uh, vocal analysis videos of singers live and things like that, and I really do enjoy doing those. But today I felt it necessary to kind of take a different direction. I haven't done a video that's strictly instructional in probably about two months, so I figured it was about time that I do one. Um, today I'm addressing a a subject and a topic that's very dear and close to my heart, something that is extremely important to me. I'm going to be talking about warning signs of bad voice teachers. I've just seen enough stuff on YouTube. I've seen enough commentary and enough critiques of singers and things and enough vocal instruction and heard enough programs and things up to this point to where I just enough's enough and I have to address some of these things. I feel almost ethically responsible as a professional in the industry to let some of you know some of these things that are being said. I'm not going to overtly call names, but you might get a little, oh, I don't know, hint every now and then as to whom I might be referring. So I have a lot of things to talk about, and I'm going to try to make each point as concise as possible, but I'd like to be thorough. Picking a voice teacher is very hard, and it should be. The process of finding a voice teacher that you mesh with and one that has your best interest in mind and not your wallet in mind is very difficult to do. Everybody claims that they have that secret sauce, the secret recipe to singing success. Everybody claims that they know the answer to all of your problems. And it all just so happens to be that everyone wants your money as well, right? Everywhere you look on YouTube, everywhere you look in private studios, people want your money and they promise the best instruction, right? Well, I understand how that could get extremely confusing for people who don't know any better. You go into it just looking for a good place to invest your money where you're going to get good quality service for what you pay for. Now, I want to preface all of this by saying that this is not a take lessons from me video. If you walk away from this and you are convinced that you want to take live in-studio lessons, actually, I'd probably be happier with that. Um, online lessons are worse than live lessons. I will tell you that right up front. It's the reason that I don't charge as much for online lessons as I do for my live in-person lessons. It's harder for a voice teacher to hear the nuances of your singing if you're in different acoustic settings. And a microphone digitally over the internet can only hear so much. There are elements of your singing that I would not be able to hear in a private lesson. So any voice teacher that tells you that their online teaching is as good as what they could offer in person right off the bat, something to look out for. I just want to throw that out there up front. I'm not making this into an advertisement for myself. Now, I don't do these seven things that I recommend against. And at the end of the video, I have three things that are signs of good teachers, and I make sure that all three of those are regularly checked off of my list. That does not mean that these are all of the bad signs of a bad voice teacher. And it also doesn't mean that the three things at the end are the only three things you need to look for when you find a good teacher. But these are all things that I wanted to point out. Also, at the very end of the video, for those of you who watch all the way through, you will get to see who won the competition for choosing my 1,000 subscriber analysis. So uh, I hope you guys uh, look forward to that. I hope you stick through the video to see that. And I'll also reveal who the series is going to be on. So I hope you guys enjoy that. Um, if you haven't yet, please like this video. Please subscribe. And I'm going to go ahead and ask you up front. If you enjoy this video, please share it. And I have not really requested that you guys share my videos up to this point. And the reason is that I would rather this channel grow organically. I'm not a big fan of like going out and marketing to try to make this the biggest channel on YouTube. I want people who are genuinely interested in this content to see it. But I really think that this video is going to be one of the most informative ones that I've made. And... I think that this is the kind of video that does need to reach a bigger audience because there's so much bad information out there and there are so many bad voice teachers on YouTube right now. And it would make me feel better just knowing that more people have seen this. Even if they just watch it and they don't subscribe, they dislike it and they never look at it again. I don't care. My point in this is to be informative and to teach people that there's a lot of stuff on YouTube that's just out there to take your money and to, to give you an inflated sense of ego um, and make you feel better about your singing that maybe you actually should all with the intention of just taking your money and running. One last thing I want to warn against before we start talking about these specific characteristics of bad voice teachers, don't fall into sunk cost fallacy. What I mean by that is if you get into one of these programs, you've already spent money on one of these programs, and you're just not getting the results that you want, and you hear this video and you think, well, I've already spent X amount of dollars on this voice teacher, or I've you know bought this program or this course, and I've been doing these warm-ups every day for, you know, a year and it's not getting where I want. That does not mean investing more into it is a good thing. If you see these warning signs, even if it's your current voice teacher right now, cut bait, get out, find someone else. I don't care who it is. As long as it's someone who doesn't do these things, go to a live studio near you, 
find um, a bel canto teacher or or someone with some pedagogical experience on YouTube, anybody that would not do these seven things. And after you've seen this video, hopefully you'll know what they are. So enough talking it up. Let's get straight into it. Here we go. Number seven, too much focus on imitation. What I mean by this is that if someone on the internet, on a YouTube video or in person or whatever, tells you that you or anybody can sound like whatever singer you want if you do things a specific way, you should watch out. I've gone over this before, but I'm going to be very clear about this. Whoever you want to sing like is the only example of that person on earth. You will not sound like them. If you're trying to be an Elvis impersonator, you might could do a pretty good job of making your voice sound pretty darn close to Elvis's, but you will not sound like him. If you're doing a cover concert for Led Zeppelin or something and you want to sound like Robert Plant for one show, okay, you might could, you know, getting a lesson on the, learning how to make the types of sounds he does isn't going to kill you. But you should not invest a long period of time into someone who tries to promise you that you will end up sounding like X singer in the long run because you won't and it will damage your voice. Another thing to look out for as far as imitation is when a voice teacher tries to tell you to do things the way that they do it, that's a big red flag. The logic behind this is exactly the same. You're not ever going to sound like your voice teacher. When I first started out with formal voice study with my voice teacher, who's still my voice teacher now 15 years later, the very first thing he told me is, Zach, stop trying to sound like me. You're not me and I'm not you. And that's one of the very first things he ever told me and it stuck with me for almost two decades. Don't listen to voice teachers that try to convince you to sound like them because you can't. Same logic. Even if they are the teacher, you can't sound like them. They should know better than to teach you that. Another element of this is that if they are more concerned with you sounding a certain way than they are concerned with what the timbre of your voice is, uh, the range of your voice is, the voice type that you are, if they don't think about these things and they just say, oh, well, it doesn't matter if you're not... Uh, Jeff Tate range baritone slash tenor or whatever he is. It doesn't matter. If you do these things, you'll sound like him. No, 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 no. That is not good. So too much focus on imitation, bad thing. Number six, too much vague terminology. And if you go back and watch my harsh vocals video, you'll see a little bit of this. Uh, but this is, I'm going to get a little bit more specific here because it's warranted and I've seen enough and it has to... I can't sleep at night until I feel like I've gotten this information out there. So I'm going to preface this by saying that certain terms in voice study have been used interchangeably. For example, head voice, falsetto, passaggio, resonance. You will hear different schools of pedagogy use those terms interchangeably. That is okay. The reasoning is complicated and I don't want to spend forever talking here, but ultimately it comes down to the two major, major branches of voice study started in Italy and in Germany. And they came up with similar but different concepts on how to phonate and how to create sounds. And as they did that, the terms sort of got intermingled as the school started converging. And I still run into that now. And there was light. I forgot to turn the light on before I started making this video. Sorry, guys. Anyway, what I was saying is that if five different voice coaches use one term and they all use it to mean something different or they never seem to line up as to what exactly it refers to, it's probably not legitimate. It's probably just some buzzword and it probably doesn't really mean anything. For example, compression. And I get, I'm going to get there. Hold your horses because I know that you're thinking if you know anything about this compression thing that you know I know what you're thinking. Hold on. Dis vocal distortion, false fold manipulation. These types of terms are things that are vague and you could hear four different perspectives on what they actually mean. And every one of these voice teachers that you find that talks about these terms tries to describe them in a different way. There was one teacher that I'm not going to name who so went so far as to say that compression is a bel canto technique that this person updated. Uh-uh. You can ask any bel canto teacher on the planet and they're not going to tell you anything about compression relating to bel canto singing and we're going to I'm going to show you why in a second. So the next element is that technical singing is important. Understanding the technique in the voice is very important. I try to use this channel to convey some of that side of things to all of you. But there should be a balance between learning the mechanism and its function and actually learning to use it. And so if a teacher just 
uses copious amounts of terminology and they constantly are barraging you with all these words like rotunda and over the pencil, as we've talked about before. That's usually detrimental because there are certain terms that we use universally academically because it helps keep things simple for people to understand. When people start coming in using whatever word they come up with to copyright their patented technique or whatever it is, it just muddies the waters. I cannot count the number of people since I started this channel who come up to me and asked, hey, can you explain the difference between head voice and mixed voice? Uh, can you tell me what compression is? I get those questions all the time and they don't have to be that way because there are answers to these that are rooted in academia. And these people that try to push their own terminology over those terms make it far more complicated for people that are just trying to learn. Here's the most important point. Don't be afraid to challenge your teacher. If a teacher knows his or her stuff on the subject, they will welcome your questions. Okay. If you ask your teacher a question and they give you some garbled, almost nonsensical kind of like, Oh yeah, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. This is compression. So when you use your mouth this way, they, it's a nice compressed vowel and vowels are compressed when you do this. And then you compress with your vocal folds. When they talk like that, watch out. If they can't describe their own rhetoric in a way that's simple and easy for you to understand, it's a bad thing. And there's a lot of that on YouTube, even from people that you might not expect. So here's a relevant quote. And this is coming from my academic advisor, my voice teacher of almost two decades and the PhD in voice as a professor where I went to college. I asked him his thoughts on compression. And this is his quote. On hyperglottal compression, terminology has always been, to some extent, vague and inconsistent in the voice teaching profession. That said, there can be little doubt that this technique is based on lots of breath pressure and lots of glottal resistance. That's a recipe for high risk of vocal fatigue, injury, and damage. Teaching such an approach to singing seems to be associated with hard rock, metal, and the like. I would speculate that hyperglottal compression is a virtually surefire method of achieving a rough, raspy voice quality. I would not recommend this approach for anyone, and I regard those who do as more interested in a specific result than in the well welfare of their students' voices. So he says it all right there. This concept of compression, it overuses elements of the voice just based upon the glottal function, okay? And the way that breath pressure is distributed through the glottis as sound is created. So it's the idea is to make the pressure greater on the folds. And this is a whole different subject that I I feel like I have to make a response to this too because there's been so many bad videos on it, but I don't want to spend 15 minutes of it here. But ultimately what this is arguing, what hyperglottal compression argues is that you maximize the amount of pressure above the glottis when you sing so that the sound comes out in a more forceful way. And when you do that, the amount of push that comes underneath is what projects the sound. And if you've watched my videos for any period of time, you know that push is something that I actively am, I'm actively against. I want you to create sound by natural space and resonance because it's healthier. Pushing from the glottis to make sound come out ultimately is going to damage your voice. And so someone with a PhD in the subject has spoken on it as well. And I know that I'm doing an appeal to authority, but I'm doing that because I have more respect for this individual than anyone I've ever known when it comes to vocal pedagogy and understanding of the voice. He knows it all. If he doesn't know it, I don't know who does. And to give you a little bit about a bit about his background, he got his PhD under a lady named Miss Barbara Dosher. And for those of those people who are aware of Barbara Dosher, know that she was one of the pioneers of pedagogy in the 20th century. She's written multiple books that have been used across campuses and colleges throughout the United States. So she is a highly regarded researcher and academic of vocal pedagogy, and he studied directly under her, and he was my voice teacher. So I have an immense amount of respect for his opinion. Now, I know that that's just one person's thoughts, but if you start talking to people in the academic realm about the voice, these are the kinds of comments you're going to get. When you start talking to people that have real, like, major credentials in the subject, these are the kinds of things they're going to say when you see them talk about, when you ask them about things like hyperglottal compression. So number five, they demonstrate more than they listen. This is so important. And I'm just going to go right into it because I think that my points explain it pretty well. We are voice teachers. We are only about 50% voice teacher. I tell every single one of my students, ask them, I am not just a voice teacher. I am a trusted pair of ears. My job is to listen to you. 
My job is not to sing at you and say, do what I did. My job is to listen to you, take the sound in, analyze it, and produce an analysis that gives you a better understanding of the types of sounds you're creating and the implications of those sounds. My job is not to sing at you. We should be judged by our critical listening skills, not our singing ability. If a teacher is unable to accurately tell what a singer is doing, they're not a very good voice teacher. Would you take your car to a mechanic that tries to replace your carburetor when, you're, when you've got a blown head gasket? No, you wouldn't do that. So voice teachers should be treated to that same standard. The difference between a car and, a, and the voice, though, in this case, is that you know, if a mechanic destroys your car, well, sure, you know, it sucks, and it would cost you a lot of money to get it replaced if they don't replace it for you. But if you destroy your voice, that's all you got. And you got to live with it forever and you can't replace it. So voice teachers should be held to this degree of scrutiny because it's not fair for people to trust in them and they provide a product that's destructive and the, the purchaser doesn't know any better and they listen and they end up suffering for it in the long run while the voice teacher runs off with their paychecks. People pay us to give professional feedback, not to show off our James Hetfield covers. That's not what we do. People have asked me so many times to do a video of myself singing on this channel. No, I might one day. It has nothing to do with my inability to sing, but it's not relevant. It doesn't matter. I've got videos of myself singing all over YouTube and my other channels if you look hard enough, and that's why I don't really go all out to make a new video because I don't need to. That's not the point. Ask yourself, what good does it really do for someone to show off that they can sing like James Hetfield? What does that tell you about their ability to coach you as a singer? What does that tell you about their ability to teach you how to sing in a way that's good for you or healthy for you or even matches James Hetfield, even if you didn't care about vocal health? If your goal was to sing like James Hetfield, how does someone making the sounds he makes say anything about his, his or her ability to teach you to do it? Think about that. Number four, and this is kind of related, using their singing as their qualifier to teach. Great singers don't always make great teachers. It's just like anything. We don't know if Tom Brady could teach someone to throw a football as well as he can throw it himself. You know, we don't know that. It, just because he's one of the best in the world at what he does doesn't mean he's, a good, he's good at teaching other people to do it. Kind of sticking with the football analogy here, I think his name is Tom House. He's an extremely well-renowned quarterback coach, like a private teacher on how of, of throwing the football. And a lot of football players go to him in the off season to get work. He's a baseball pitcher. He doesn't even throw footballs. He's an amazing coach for quarterbacks. And he's produced some of the best results that anyone's ever seen in the NFL. Tom Brady's studied under him. Drew Brees studied under him. Matt Ryan studied under him. All these big names in football studied under him. And he's not even a, he doesn't even throw a football. I mean, he does, but he was a professional baseball pitcher. So your ability to sing does not necessarily mean you're a great teacher. You don't need a degree to teach voice, but the teacher has to show a background in pedagogical proficiency. Your credentials should be more heavily based upon the understanding that you have of the mechanism and the way that you can convey it. The amount of students you work with is important too, but there are a lot of people who've had a lot of voice students that still aren't great teachers. So the most important thing is that you can demonstrate clear competency in the pedagogy and the methods of singing and the differentiations between the ways that sounds are created. That's the most important thing. If a teacher advertises lessons strictly based upon how, they, how well they sing, be wary. Teachers should be advertising their philosophies, their methods, their backgrounds, their credentials, and their commitment to your growth. Those are the things that are the most important. All of those things are far more relevant than how well they sing. A teacher should be telling you how often they give you assignments. What's their game plan for you? What is their approach? What do they prioritize when they teach? These things are what's important. It's not about, let's get you sounding like James Hetfield. That is not what you want as a voice student. You want someone that's going to take an interest in you as an individual. They want you to ultimately to trust them. That should be the goal is your true undivided trust. This is a quick side note. Someone who sits there and name drops, oh, I taught this great singer. I taught that great singer. I taught this great singer usually is a little, that is usually a no-go. Now, there are some like major big name vocal coaches who have taught some major big name singers who've had incredible careers. Those guys can name drop. But if a voice teacher claims to have taught some pop singer that had a hit single and that's like their claim to fame, 
I wouldn't buy into that very much. I wouldn't worry about that very much. If someone claims that they are on some TV show for doing some crazy feat that the normal human voice can't do, that's not teaching credentials. Those things, it's a no-go. I've taught some people who are not famous, but pretty well known within their circles. Uh, and I'm not going to sit here and name drop them. First off, I don't have their permission. But second off, that doesn't say anything about my ability to teach. What if someone listened to them and said, oh, I don't think he's a very good singer at all. Like, what? Well, it doesn't do any good. Number three, and I'm sure you guys knew this was coming. They try to argue against the science. So this is something that I've found on YouTube just ad nauseum, and I get so sick of it. I mean, it, it's just tiring how hard they try to justify their own lack of understanding by discrediting the people who devote their lives to understanding the subject better. One of the biggest things you'll find with someone that doesn't understand the science or doesn't understand the, the methodology is they'll use blanket terms. Breathe, just breathe from your diaphragm or have good support when you sing. Make sure you've got good support. Make sure your cords close when you sing. Make sure you don't have a lot of pressure when you sing. Well, they just blanket statements like that. Those are generally signs that someone does not understand the subject very well. Another thing that they'll do is argue that common vocal functions are fake or not legitimate. For example, and these are real examples, I've seen someone say that the laryngeal tilt is a myth perpetuated by people who make peer review articles so that you have to pay them to see them and they don't want the public being able to see the information on laryngeal tilt because it's fake. Yes, that argument exists. Yes, that argument exists on YouTube. So, like, just to give you a quick example, this is laryngeal tilt. See that? That looks real to me, right? Case closed, right? Well, this person has more subscribers than I probably ever will. So the same person also argues that subglottal pressure and pressure as a whole is fake. So on that note, another thing they'll do is they'll argue that academic voice study is classist and it's restrictive. I get this argument a lot too, that, that people who take an academic approach to the voice are trying to tell you that there is a right and a wrong way to use the voice when that's not the case at all. Academic study is just designed so that we can better understand and better teach it. It has nothing to do with trying to say, oh, well, everyone who doesn't use this stuff is wrong because you're not wrong. You can choose to do whatever you want with your voice. But the goal of the average vocal academic is to help people make more informed decisions. And who wouldn't want to make more informed decisions? If you actively choose not to make more informed decisions, you're by definition being ignorant. So who wouldn't want to make better informed decisions? I don't know. That argument just doesn't hold water with me. Any kind of commentary that you run into where they cast classical singing into this wide, undesirable net, like it's stifling and that it, you know you can't do it in anything but opera, which is completely untrue. The truth is that just about every major singer that went to college that you run into went through some degree of classical, fundamental classical training. Being a classically trained singer doesn't necessarily mean that you sing classical music. It just means that you've taken the classical academic singing principles that we've studied throughout the various schools of vocal study over the years, and you apply them. You use good support underneath with, with the depression of the diaphragm. You try to maintain a clear, consistent, even tone that's honest to your voice. You don't sing with force. You don't push too hard. These things are all fundamental classical singing principles. Use legato when you sing. That does not mean you're going out and singing Verdi. Totally different. So anytime a teacher casts classical singing as into this net of like, oh, you're going to sound like an opera singer if you do this stuff, just don't listen to it. It's not true. And that person has some sort of vendetta. Maybe they couldn't hack it or they learned. I don't know what it was, but it's not true. They also tend to overemphasize the vocal range rather than healthy coordination because range is flashy, right? You know, like they'll tell you, oh, well, you, you can have the range to sing anything you want. Your range can go as far as you want it to. Uh-uh. That ain't true. I'm a baritone. My modal register may go up to an E flat on a good day. On a really good day, it goes up to an F sharp. And most of the time, I'm already moving into head voice by then. If someone tried to tell me that I could sing like Vitas, then 
and they are completely lying. It's not possible. My voice will never do that because it's not built to. So people that overemphasize the range, and they try to say that, you know, all this coordination stuff is all built around your range. No, that's not it. It's actually the opposite. Your range expands as your coordination gets better. So people who overemphasize vocal range rather than the science behind the coordination of the voice, red flag for sure. Number two, they advocate a one-size-fits-all approach. I cannot emphasize how poor this is. This is bad, okay? Voice instruction is one of the most intrinsically personalized trainings that you can undergo. Think of it like fitness and dieting, right? You don't just go up to a weight trainer and they say, oh, I'm just going to have you do this exactly like I tell you to do it, like exactly like everyone else does, and you're going to end up looking exactly like this person over here. That's not how it works. One size fits all approach to vocalization and vocal technique is flawed because it assumes that everyone's voice has the same sizes of every part of the mechanism. It assumes that everyone has a propensity to sing in the same ranges. It's just so wrong. No two voices need the exact same training. Pick any two of my voice students that, that I work with regularly. They could tell you, I'm sure that if any of them are watching this video, they'd vouch for this. While they may have the same similar sort of structures of the way the exercises go and the exercises are based in similar patterns, the things that I tell them to emphasize are all different. No two of my students go through their exercises the same way because they all are working on different things. That's how voice teaching should be. Another thing, if a boy, if an online coach sells you a bunch of CDs or like a, like a course that has a bunch of MP3 files or whatever that has you do all these warm-ups on it and exercises every day, it's a rip-off because just singing through exercises doesn't develop your voice. Having the feedback to understand what you're doing well and what you're not doing well in that exercise is far more important than just going through this routine. A coach should be able to have you go through your warm-ups and give you notes and things to practice to add to them later. And that's how I do my lessons. That's how my lessons that I've gotten throughout my life have been structured. I've been told, okay, well, in this exercise, be thinking about this. Or, you know, when you sing this descending arpeggio, make sure that you connect the notes in a legato fashion, right? Somebody else might not have that problem at all. So when you give someone just a series of warm-ups on a tape to play over and over again, that is not helping them develop as an individual singer. Another thing that kind of fits under the same umbrella, watch out for phrases on, on YouTube videos like thumbnails and, and even voice coaches who straight up say in their videos, you're not a good singer if you can't do this, or you only need one warm up to be good. Things like that. It's not true. They're just trying to get your attention. They're not trying to actually help you develop as a singer. There are exercises that not everyone can even do. There are certain exercises that are designed exclusively for women. There are some exercises that are designed exclusively for men. When I do my exercises, I invert the vowels based on if it's a woman or a man, based on the hourglass thing that I've talked a lot of you about. So you can't just say that this exercise does it for everybody. This one thing makes you a good singer. That doesn't work like that. That's not how it works. And so moving on to the number one thing they don't look at your long-term vocal health. This is, if you find a teacher that is trying to pressure you into a short-term solution, run as fast as you can. Trust me on this. Vocal training and development is a marathon. It's not a sprint. You will not be the singer you want to be in one month. You won't. I'm sorry, I hate to tell you this, but you won't. The coordinations and the muscle memory that we develop through vocalization takes a long time to change because we habitually use our voices all the time to speak. So to convince your muscle groups that are used to doing things a certain way to do them differently is going to take time, just like any habit. Like you don't start doing curls on your biceps at 100 pounds each, right? You don't do that. You have to start out somewhere and develop to it. Singing is the same way. And if someone tries to tell you, I want to get you in and I want to get you out, which are literally the words that I've heard from a specific voice teacher, stay away from that because it's not true. Yes, it's important to go out and actually perform and not just take lessons all the time, but you should not be convinced that you're going to become a masterful singer in just a few weeks. It doesn't work that way. Every age group is dealing with different physical states of the vocal me mechanism and should be treated as such. I hate seeing all these like 13, 14 year old girls singing this stuff like Beyonce. It's so bad for you because their physical configuration of their voices is not anywhere near developed to the point that Beyonce's was. 
it's so bad for kids to have them singing with the kind of push and pressure and strain that someone at Beyonce's age and training have experienced and have done. You can't do that. And if voice teachers try to push you into things that your voice isn't ready to do, you probably won't know the difference if you're not educated on the subject and you're going to end up hurting yourself. So if someone tries to tell you that it doesn't matter how old you are, if you try to see something, they're wrong. Try listening to a 20-year-old try to sing a Wagner aria and tell me how that sounds. On that same note, watch out for teachers calling their students fully matured prematurely. If you're under 25, you are not a full-grown singer. You're not. You might be a vocal adolescent. For men, the vocal peak doesn't typically hit until the mid-30s. I'm 31. Technically, I might maybe be starting in my vocal peak now. Maybe. For women, you might be starting your vocal peak or full development at 25. Maybe. Possibly. But that's a long shot. You are not a fully developed singer until you are older. Now, there are hormonal elements of this for women that are different that can change these things a bit, so it's a little more variable. But for men especially, you are not a fully developed singer until you're 30 at the very, very youngest. So if anybody, if you're, my, my biggest demographic who watch my videos are between the ages of like 22 and 32. So if you are around that age range and you're watching this video and you've had a voice teacher tell you that your voice is fully grown, and it's like, you know, like you are ready to do anything that you want as a singer, they're lying to you. It's not true. It's physically not true. The, the larynx is not hard enough to maintain some of the things that you might be wanting to do. It hasn't strengthened enough yet. Don't listen to them. They're not telling you the truth. So. Those are all the bad things. Now I'm going to end this video with some signs of a good voice teacher so that you all kind of have a point of reference of what you should look for. And these aren't in any specific order. All three of these are very important. Number one, the teacher adjusts your exercises, your warm-up regimen, your repertoire, all those things to the what's comfortable with your voice, what's comfortable in your range, what's comfortable for you to understand how to sing, what's, comfor com what's comfortable to you by what you like. These are the signs of a good voice teacher. They adapt to your voice. They don't try to force what they think you should do on you. Number two, they place an equal emphasis on technique and artistry. I'm a technician by heart, but once someone gets technique down, we spend a lot of time working on the artistry of the music. It's super important to me too because technique makes it correct in terms of its performance. Artistry makes it beautiful. And so you have to have a combination of, a bo of both. So a good teacher is going to understand that and have you work on both concepts and at least have you thinking about one or the other all the time. Number three, a good voice teacher's main goal is for you to create an honest, healthy sound that maximizes everything that your voice uniquely has to offer. While you may never be James Hetfield, you are you. What X, whatever your name is, whatever your name is out there in internet land, you are the only you that exists on this planet. And because of that, you should maximize what you have to offer because no one else will ever sound like you, just like you will never sound like James Labrie for better or worse. So keep that in mind. A good voice teacher is going to emphasize that. They are not going to try and get you to sound like something that you're not. So that was a lot. I know a lot of information. I tried to fly through it. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. A few quick things. I'm going to put the link to my Discord server in the description. If you guys want to join in, you got any, any questions, anything like that, please feel free to join. Um, my Patreon link is right here. If you are interested in lessons, let me know. Um, like I said at the beginning of the video, online lessons are not quite as effective in my view as live lessons. I still will give them and we still can gain from them. And you can ask any of my students that we still do gain from them. But you will get more from finding a live teacher like someone in person. So if you choose to look for a, a teacher that's local to you, I would recommend that if you can. But if you don't have another option and you need a voice teacher, I'm more than willing to help out. I would love to help. I'd love to work with you. Um, please like and subscribe if you haven't. And for once, I'm going to actually say, please share this video. Like I said at the beginning, share this because I want this to reach a wide audience, not to get not to get attention to my channel, because I honestly think that this is probably going to get some bad feedback from some of the fans of some of these other voice coaches. Um, they've been known to like pursue vo YouTube channels that kind of attack some of this stuff. So, you know, I hope that doesn't happen, but I do want this information to be out there in the public. So please share this video. Please comment, start a conversation. I'll answer as many questions as I possibly can about the subject. Thank you for all of your support, guys. I'm so close to a thousand subscribers. I'm like 850 as of this video. So I'm going to announce the winner of the contest. Now, it was kind of weird because someone guessed two names at once. So if you didn't see my last video, I had a contest going to where when I hit a thousand subscribers, I'm going to do a three-part series on one specific singer. And so I had a contest where everyone could guess in the comments 
comments, one singer that they think that it might be on, the first person to guess the name, will get to get a free analysis of any singing video they'd like. Well, someone guessed two people, and the person was in that guess. But since they guessed two, I didn't count it. And it, the person was their second guess anyway. BT, whoever you are, you won. Your first guess was Mike Patton. So at 1,000 subscribers, I'm going to do a three-part series on Mike Patton, uh, talking about different elements of different times of his voice and different methods that he uses to sing. And we're going to go through some of that. It's going to be a lot of fun. So... BT, you get to choose your analysis. Please reach out to me on the comments, and I'd love to uh, get that settled with you. And uh, I hope you guys had fun taking some guesses at that. Anyway, that's it for today. I hope you all enjoy this. I hope you all learn something from this. And I will see you all next week. Take care. Thanks. Bye.